blessing. And I'm thankful for the one day I ran to the city of refuge and uh, found forgiveness there, found everlasting life. And uh, if you've never studied it, you ought to go study that Old Testament law concerning the city of refuge and how it's a picture of Jesus Christ because somebody who was guilty could go there and the avenger of blood couldn't touch them so long as they were in that city. And, uh, there, but there was one contingency, and that was it was only good as long as the high priest was alive. And if the high priest died, you were on your own. And uh, then when you bring that over, that idea over to the uh, New Testament, and you realize that Christ, the city of refuge, yes. is also our great high priest Amen. who died once and for all time and will never die again. Uh, I'm telling you, that's eternal security right there, uh, Old and New Testament. We had a good Sunday school lesson and I just taught the batteries out of that thing this morning. So we'll do a little work there. <clears throat> Would you turn with me this morning to uh, Genesis and uh, chapter 1, please. Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Been in a series on Sunday mornings here. Thank you, Brother Zach. I sure appreciate Brother Zach. All that he does. He uh, recharges my batteries in a lot of ways. <laughs> and sometimes runs them down. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Been in a series... Uh, for the, a few Sunday mornings now on uh, looking at God's original purpose in creating each and every one of us. And uh, it's important to understand that when he created Adam, he created you. Uh, you were in Adam. So the purpose for which he created Adam is the purpose for which you exist. And a lot of times life doesn't work like it should because man is not in connection with the purpose of his creation. Um, and uh, we're going we're gonna to read from some verses and get into God's word here in a minute. But I was thinking about this this week, uh, and probably some of you have seen this, but one of the most popular types of videos on social media nowadays are what are called life hacks. Has anybody seen uh, any of these? And uh, it's something where you, you take something and you apply it to something. And, and these videos are meant to kind of wow and say, whoa, I didn't realize that could be used for that. Or this could make life easier or something like that. Um, one, one of such video I saw was uh, somebody took one of those uh, plastic uh, lids off of a, a package of baby wipes. Uh, I'm talking about the ones, the little flip up lid uh, plastic lid on a, a package of baby wipes and then they glued it to the side of a, of a Doritos bag and then cut an X in the side of the Doritos bag so that you can flip up the plastic lid and stick two fingers in there and fish a Dorito out of there and then close the plastic lid. And I just thought that that works but let me tell you something else that works. You, you pinch one side of the bag at the top and the other side of the bag at the top and you pull and then you can stick your whole arm down in there or pour them out or, or whatever. That works too. And then if you don't eat the whole bag and you really shouldn't uh, eat the whole bag, then they make a little chip clip thing and you put that on there and that, that does the same thing. But, but there, look, God created man with a creative mind and an inventive mind. And so now, and it's always been like this, but now it's, it's just so prolific that man is just always thinking about ways to reuse things and then put it out there for other people just to gawk at. And, and uh, it's really about likes. I mean, let's be honest, that's what it is. It's about likes and views and uh, things like that and, and shares. People say, hey, share this with somebody. And, and, and so then you, you have to go out and buy baby wipes so you can get that little plastic lid off the top and then glue it to your Doritos bag. And, and then you got to, I guess, take it off that and, and use it on the next Doritos bag or, or whatever. And I'm just telling you, a lot of those things, and I've seen some that make no sense at all. 
It's like, it's like, how does that make life any easier? And then there's videos where people intentionally sabotage something that it's supposed to be used for so they can show you how to use something else to do the same thing much harder. And, and I, I, don't, I don't get that too. Uh, but the reality is there's a lot of people that are trying to use their life in a way that it was not created for and they're just making things more difficult. They're making things harder on themselves and other people that are around them because they haven't come to grips with the fact that we are created beings and we were created for a purpose and until we grab hold of that purpose, life's not going to go the way it's intended to go. And, and by the way, if that offends you, I, I don't mean it offensive, but I can't help preaching the truth this morning that God has an intention for the way that your life goes. And your life's not going to be what you need it to be or what he wants it to be until you surrender to the purpose for which you were created. And so we've taken a couple weeks to establish what that purpose is. Uh, the first message in this series we were not able to look at God's creative work in the beginning of Genesis, but we went to Ephesians chapter 1 and saw where before the foundation of the world, God had already chosen us in Christ to be holy and without blame before Him in love, meaning in a loving relationship, and that He intended for us to be His children for us to have a relationship with this true and living almighty God as his children. Not in a weird way, not in a, uh, not in a, a, a strange begotten way like the, the Mormon church teaches where Elohim came down and cohabitated with Mary and brought about uh, these two brothers, Lucifer and Jesus, and uh, all of their false doctrinal teaching that originated not from the true and living God, but from Joseph Smith. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a reality I want you to understand here. There is a true and living God. He wants to be like a father to his children. He wants that kind of relationship with us. He created man for that purpose, to have that kind of wonderful and loving relationship with him. But he also created man to be able to choose. And so in Genesis chapter 3, we find that man chose. Man made a choice. We don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us how long of a gap there was between God creating man from the dust of the earth, breathing into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man becoming a living soul and when the serpent came and deceived Eve in the garden and she took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband also and he did eat, we don't know what kind of a time gap there is there, but there's something very telling about God's purpose for humanity when in that instance and in that same chapter, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, that in verse number 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Everything about this verse insinuates that God wasn't making some special appearance on this particular day. That this was a regular occurrence. That fellowship had taken place. That relationship had been had. But now all of a sudden God was going to demonstrate that that fellowship was not there and that relationship was not what he designed it to be because when they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, I can just imagine in my mind that every other day where this has happened, they had gone running to God and excited to see their creator God and, and a God who represented a father to them and they were glad to see him come walking in the garden but on this day, things were different. The Bible says in the end of verse number 8, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of, pardon me, of the garden. I find it interesting that under the guilt of sin, the shame of their nakedness, man sought to hide themselves among other elements 
of God's creation. They, they position themselves amongst the trees of the garden. Uh, let me just tell you, it just shows me that their estimation of God had already changed uh, due to the fall. I, I don't feel like before their sin, they would have ever thought of God as one who couldn't see them behind a tree. But now they're hiding themselves. Now they're, they're running for cover. And the Lord God called unto Adam, the Bible says, and said unto him, where art thou? And I'm telling you, there's so much profound truth in this because God would have been perfectly just to go walking right on by and not have any, uh, any effort of reaching out to them whatsoever. God's holy. God's righteous. God can't have any part with sin. But God is also gracious. And the New Testament tells us that the grace with which God operates is a quality with which he operated even before the creation of the world. It wasn't new for God to be gracious. God has always been who he is. And he's always been gracious. And so in his grace, he reaches out to Adam. He, he calls out to Adam. But even in his call, he had to demonstrate that there was now separation between them. Now there was, there was a gap between them. Where art thou? He would call out to Adam. Adam responds in verse number 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11, God says, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman. Sound familiar? The man said, The woman. Somebody says, Oh, I see Adam's going to blame his wife. But keep reading. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me. You read it for yourself and tell me who Adam's really blaming. He's not blaming the wife. He's blaming God. You gave me this woman, God. The woman that thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And let me just tell you, her seed has a name. Her seed is the one whom the children of Israel were waiting for. Her seed is the one that God had spoken to Abraham and said, that her seed is going to now be thy seed. And, and, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob knew that in them, in their line, was going to be a seed, and that seed was going to be her seed, the one that was going to come, and his heel was going to be bruised by Satan's dominion, but that, that this heel was going to crush the head of Satan. I was telling... Uh, uh, somebody about this uh, this week when we were talking, but one of the most offensive things that I've ever seen, one of the most blasphemy, uh, greatest blasphemies I've ever seen against Scripture uh, was when uh, I was waiting uh, for somebody to go into surgery up at Mercy Hospital. And uh, I was standing there outside of the surgery waiting room and waiting to find out specific information about where this individual was was going to be going to and where they were going to be recovering and things like that. And I was waiting on the nurses who were very busy at the time. And I was standing there and in a little carved out area of the wall, there was a statue there. Well, I understand I'm in a, I'm in a Catholic hospital and so there's, uh, it's not going to be un unusual to me to expect to see a statue or even a statue of Mary. And that's what it was. It was a statue of Mary. But as I stopped for a second and glanced at that statue and was looking at it, uh, in, in a few moments, I, I was astounded by what I saw. And what I saw was Mary's foot on the head of a serpent in this statue. And let me just tell you, Mary did not bring an end to Satan's dominion. Ma Mary was not the one 
that was promised of God to come and set things right again and make an opportunity for God to get out, un, out from under Satan's deception like Eve had become. No, that promise wasn't for Mary. That was to the seed of a woman. Not to Mary, but the one who would be virgin born. It was Jesus Christ and none other than Jesus Christ who would come and by his death upon the cross, he would, he would make a show of of the handwriting of ordinances that were against us and taking them out of the way, he would make a show out of the principalities and powers that triumphed over us. And now Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, would triumph over Satan so that when from the cross he would say, it is finished, he was saying that, look, the, the, the hold of Satan has now been broken. Mankind can be free from his dominion. It's possible for you to be translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. It's possible through the seed of the woman, not the woman, but the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. And God made that promise. Do you understand what God was promising there? God was promising that through his promised Savior that man could have free, unbroken, and restored relationship with him once again. Can I put it like this? The purpose can still be realized. Because of a promise, God came on the scene and he made. Because of that promise, man, though dead in sin, can be brought back to life again. Because of that promise, man that was separated from God can now be reconciled again. Now, man who was dead and dying and, and, and lost from God could now be, this is one of my favorite expressions, could now be made new I want to tell you this morning, there's nothing like being made new through the power of the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. To know, as, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, that old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. You realize the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature you know what that word creature means? You say animal. No, it means created being. What God does through Jesus Christ when somebody realizes I'm a sinner and I'm separated from God and there is a true and living God and he made me and he made me to have fellowship with him but I can't have fellowship with him because I'm a sinner and he's holy and he's righteousness but I heard a story, I heard a message, I heard somebody tell me this good news of Jesus Christ that God knows about my sin and he took all my sin and he put my sin on the back of his son who bore it to Calvary and died on a cross and rose again victorious over death, hell and the grave so that if I will just believe that what Jesus did was for me, I can be forgiven of my sins and restored to relationship with God again. Friend, that is the gospel. And if you believe that, you are made new in Christ Jesus. Meaning this, restored to that purpose again. I, I, I'd pastored for about maybe two years and going out, knocking doors, telling people, uh, trying to communicate with people the gospel, people that I meet, try to develop relationships with people at grocery stores and, and Walmart and, and restaurants that I go to. Listen, there's people all around us that need to hear the good news. And I, as I was doing that, I just kind of became somewhat disillusioned with what, the gospel, what I felt like the gospel had become to so many people. And if you're, you'll bear with me for just a moment, I, I want to tell you kind of the, the journey that I went through there. But as I talked to people and even as I w would hear the gospel proclaimed sometime, 
I begin to be very concerned about slight shifts in the focus and the emphasis of the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that maybe what was being preached through gospel presentations and gospel deliveries was more of Jesus being a fire escape than presenting the true element of salvation. You say, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean like it's not bad to have a plan for how you're going to talk to somebody about the gospel or tell somebody the gospel. But, but, but at that time, even in independent Baptist churches, there were plans being taught that, that and I'm not saying this is bad to do. Stay with me here. Uh, don't don't uh, miss the point of what I'm trying to say. But it would kind of go like this. Uh, you're going to die because of your sin. And if you die in your sin, you're going to go to hell. And you don't want to go to hell, do you? I mean, that's an awful place. It's fire and torment. And it's, uh, it's, it's a place that, that's just uh, 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 so, so horrific and so awful. You don't want to go there. You want to go to a place of bliss. You want to go to a place of splendor. You want to go to a place where there's a street of gold and there's a, a crystal river and, and, and there's, there, there's light and, and you want to walk around on the clouds. And so here's the thing. You're, you either go to hell or you go to heaven and you don't want to go to to hell you want to go to heaven and you and and somebody would look at somebody and say, and present it in that fashion and somebody would say well no I'll be honest with you I don't want to uh, be burn in an awful torment for a long time I would like to die and uh, when I die know that I'm going to a place of splendor and beauty and uh, just beautiful music and all the things that we might uh, develop in our imagination as to what heaven is so say this prayer And if you say this prayer, then you won't have to go there. You'll go there. And this is the problem I began to see with that. Let's say that that was sincere. And let's say that there was true belief and even repentance of sin. That presentation of the gospel deals only with places it doesn't deal with the heart of why God wants to save man. I'm going to make a bold statement that I hope you'll think about. But God doesn't want to save you so that you'll go to heaven. God wants to save you because you're separated from Him and He created you to have fellowship with Him, to walk with Him, to know Him, to have relationship with Him. And guess what? I don't have to wait till I die one day and go to heaven to know that I'm walking with God each and every day. The thing I begin to see with a generational shift in the emphasis of the gospel was that the gospel had become shallow in my estimation. That there were people that even if they were truly born again and truly saved, they were waiting for this day yet future when, they would, when everything would be okay when they would go to heaven and they, would, they had never been called to realize that salvation is not just about someday off in the future when you die, but salvation is about today. Because the moment I called upon Jesus as my Savior, I was reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, His Son. And ever since that day, I've been able to walk with Him, talk with Him. I hear Him speak to my heart, not in an audible voice, but I hear Him speak to my heart by His Spirit through His Word. I talk with Him in prayer. He hears my prayers and He answers my prayers. How do you know? Because I know. I know in the way that so many other people know seated in this congregation today because you also have walked with him. You also have talked with him. I'm not talking about emotionalism. I'm not talking about some handy little crutch that we weak-minded people lean on. And that's not to say that I don't think of us as weak-minded people. We are. But it's not something we've created as a crutch to lean on. We're leaning on His everlasting arms. We're leaning on His Word. We're leaning on His promises. And we know what kind of strength that that provides uh, in a day-to-day -day life. Look, I, 
I'm not saying that it's not about heaven. Thank God there is a heaven. And thank God I know I'm going there. But look, if salvation was all about, hey, just figure out a way to get through until you die and then you get to go to heaven, that's not what it's about. What it's about is restoring us to an original purpose for which God created each and every one of us, meaning that I could go around this room this morning and I could look every single person in the eye and tell you God created you to know Him, to have relationship with Him, to walk with Him. He loves you. He knew about you when He created you. You're not a surprise to God. You have value to God. He wants you to know Him. He wants to know you. He wants to walk together with you. He wants to hold your hand. He wants to carry you. He wants to help you. He wants to be like a shepherd to you. All of this is laid out throughout his word. It's what God desires from each element of humanity. And somebody says, well, what about the people that have turned their back on God? What about the people that have re resisted the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ? He loves them too. Well, what about the wicked sinners? He died for them so that they could be reconciled back to him. And not one person is exempted from that. I'm pretty sure that in prelude music before our service even began, our instrumentalists were playing a song called Whosoever Will. And I believe that as sure as I'm standing here right now. That Jesus' death covered all sin including sins that you might think are very heinous or not even worthy of forgiveness. I'm telling you, everybody that God created, He loves. Everybody that God created, He seeks. Everybody that God created, He wants them to know a personal relationship with Him. And so He came into the garden in Genesis chapter 3 and He said, look, I, I, you, you have violated uh, what I told you. It's obvious that you've gone your own way. And though he could have been done at that moment, can I, can I remind you that, that Satan himself, that old serpent from the Garden of Eden, his sight was already filled. God, uh, uh, God, didn't, God didn't offer him redemption. God didn't offer him reconciliation. He was already reserved in chains into everlasting destruction. Do you realize he could have done the same with you and I? Well, why didn't he, preacher? But God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of of God, exactly what he predestinated them for before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians chapter 1. To, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to as many as believe on his name. So that anyone who realizes there's a, they're a sinner and turns to Christ and says, I want to be reconciled to a holy, righteous God, and I believe that you are the only way in which that can be done. Why would somebody believe that? Because Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I started the service uh, this morning re uh, quoting out of John chapter 14. I don't want anybody walking out of here go, going, well, he's not big on heaven. No, I'm excited about heaven. I'm looking forward to going. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, 
I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But look, if we're not careful, we'll get our eyes so fixed on a place that we forget what he said three verses later. He didn't say he was the way, the truth, and the life to heaven. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Do you, do you realize why man gets to go to heaven? Because that's where God's at. Jesus is man's way back to God. And I know I've quoted these verses recently, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Do you realize in Jesus Christ and what he accomplished uh, for me, then there's no sinful record? There's no sinful account. There's just righteousness. In this world, there's trouble. In this world, there's sin. In this world, there's problems. This world is under a curse. But in Jesus Christ, there's righteousness. There's forgiveness. There's freedom. There is newness of life. Romans chapter 6. So here's what God did. You say, wait a minute. This promised seed of Genesis 3, how was that going to end Satan's dominion and set man free? Well, here was, here's what God planned. That by the coming of the seed of a woman... God would ultimately remake everything. He created originally with a purpose, and that never changed. The purpose never changed. But here's what he did. He said, I'll come and I'll remake what I made in the beginning. So that's why we read verses like, if any man be in Christ, he is a new Creature. He's a newly created being. If you read 1 Corinthians 5, you'll find out that there's two Adams. There's an old Adam and there's a new Adam. There's a first Adam and there's a second Adam. The first Adam is from earth, earthy. <laughs> the second Adam is the Lord from heaven. Do you know what Adam represented? He represented... The father of a race of mankind destined for death. So Jesus came to be a second Adam that would represent the beginning of a new race of life everlasting. So there's got to be two births because there's two races of man. There's Adam's race and there's Christ's race. Watch how this works. September 14th, 1979, I was born of Adam. Dead in trespasses and sins, separated from God, but born from Adam. I was blessed to be born into the home of a Baptist preacher, and you bet I went to church. Didn't have an option. I was there. But I want to thank God for that because I heard the gospel. I heard, I heard from God's word in my home and at church. I heard who I was. I heard who God made me to be. I heard what God wanted from my life. So when I came face to face with the conviction of my own sin and the realization that I had sinned. I had made choices that were sinful choices against God on October the 17th, 1984. As a five-year-old boy, I responded to that pricking of my heart that I was a sinner and that my sin had separated me from God. And I bowed and my dad showed me verses of Scripture 
on which my faith could stand. And that night I trusted that Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary and by his resurrection from the dead was God's satisfaction for my sins. And I believed that. And that night, even as a five-year-old boy, under, not understanding so much of the Bible and the things of God, but understanding that I was a sinner and that Jesus took my place and God accepted that. When I believed that that night, God saved my soul. God brought my spirit to life. And God promised that one day, even though I would die, my body would rise from the dead. A glorified body like his. Body, soul, and spirit. He offered me salvation that night, and I took it. But you know what else came with that? The ability to spend time with God and know that it was real. The, the ability to pray and know that God was hearing my prayers. The ability to read his Bible. And I'm, I just remember, I'm just a five-year-old boy. I, I, I was in kindergarten at the time. I could just barely read. But I still remember understanding things after I got saved that I never understood before I got saved. I, I still remember my eyes being opened to truths that were foundational to me. And as I grew and as I learned, there was a desire to tell others about this Jesus and there, were, there was a desire to see friends saved and there was the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. My mom and dad would tell you right now uh, that, that after October 17th, 1984, they didn't get a perfect kid. But they did get a kid that on occasion they could see the Spirit of God working in and they could see the fruit of that Spirit being manifested in his life and they could see a greater sense of wanting to be obedient and, and wanting to be right with the Lord because of what God had done in my life. I'm just telling you, I've seen that in kids in South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church who, who get saved and you see a difference in their life. No, they're still a kid. And if we're sitting around expecting perfection out of them, then we need to go take a big old hard look in the mirror ourselves. But I've seen the change that comes about in a young person when they trust Christ as Savior. And there's a prayer and there's a hope that, that, that now being able to know God and walk with God is going to save them from a lot of hardship down the road because, because they can be in God's Word and they can hear the instruction of God and they can follow that in their life and avoid a lot of pitfalls that other people step right into. God has His purpose to make men new. To make boys and girls new in Jesus Christ. To make men and ladies new in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ came as the seed of the woman to accomplish that very purpose. To make men new. But ultimately, his desire is to make all things new. You see... He's coming back again. His first coming, he came to deal with sin in the souls of men. In his second coming, he's coming to deal with the curse of sin on this earth. And what he makes new the second time will not be the souls of men, but will be a new heaven and a new earth. But by the time he's done and by the time you finish what he's revealed in this book, it is all restored to Genesis 1 condition. It's all back again. Everything that shouldn't be there that's been brought in by Satan and sin, it's gone. By the way, in the New Testament, he's graduated. He's not the old serpent anymore. He is still the old serpent, but he's also that old dragon. Same thing. They're both lizards. They're both sneaky. They're both subtle. In my opinion, they're both wicked. A few things, th few things more wicked to me than snakes. Right, Miss Kyrie? She owns a snake, and we, j we joke about that because I don't understand why anybody would do that. 
But, but, but the reality is that old serpent, that old dragon, he gets removed. He's gone forever. You want to read about that? That's found over in the book of Revelation and uh, chapter 20 where God deals finally with that old serpent, the devil. And, and I'm telling you, in this new heaven and new earth, he's not going to slither up to anybody and whisper his lies and tempt anybody. That, that won't be in the new heaven and the new earth. I'm going to ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 21 with me. Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 20, God purges the earth from all that was not his original intention. And now we find in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, John said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Did you read that verse? That's original purpose. That's what God wanted all along. God created the earth and all of its environment and everything to put mankind on that earth, in that Garden of Eden, and walk with Him. But then man sinned. And man's sin brought a curse even to the ground, according to Genesis chapter 3. A curse that we still live in the midst of. Look, ever since October 17th, 1984, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, but I'm still living in a sin-cursed world. But not forever. Not forever. One day, the elements that still exist of the curse of this world. I'm talking about the ground that was cursed, the dust of the ground that was cursed. All that's going to be gone. And all that's going to be left is a new heaven and a new earth. That Second Peter says, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that's all that's going to be there. Look, I'm, I'm trying to navigate this life as a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I'm thankful for the victory that I have in Jesus. But I still contend with this old flesh. And do you know why? Because this old flesh is still under a curse. You know why it's still under a curse? Remember what it's created from? The dust of the ground. I, I still have to deal with the curse because that's what my body is made out of. But I'm telling you, my spirit is alive in Jesus Christ. My soul has the promise of everlasting life upon it, given by God through Jesus Christ. I'm just waiting for this body to be done so I can get a new one. And that day's coming. I, I thought there'd be a little bit more of a response about that. I said, that day's coming. Amen. That new body that's a perfect body. That's like the body God originally created before sin messed it up. And then what he does is he just gets rid of all of the heaven and earth. All the elements melt with fervent heat. It's gone so he can make a new one where there's only righteousness. Why? Can we read verse 3 again in Revelation chapter 21? Here's why. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's what he wanted in the beginning. And that's where he's promised that this is headed. Matter of fact, we're, we won't have for sake of time. We're not going to read all of the glory and the splendor of what that looks like and, and where that's headed. But look in verse number 27, the last verse of chapter 21. And there shall in no wise enter into it 
anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Don't stop. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more... Y'all see what that says? Curse. But the throne of God... And of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Do you realize that's the last chapter of the whole book? And I don't know if you realize that, how well that dovetails with the first chapter of the book. God created all that for a purpose. And God says, I've never let go and I never will. Right. We're headed back to that purpose. But God still asks the question, who's going to get on board? Who's going to line up? Are you going to live your whole life trying to live out your own purposes and your own plans and do your own thing until you die and you're separated from me from all of eternity? Or how about this? How about you understand that I created you and why I created you and say, look, I realize that the only life worth living is one lived in fellowship with God. And not only that, if I can live in fellowship with him now, I have the hope and the promise that I will live with him forever and ever and ever, all because of Jesus Christ. He's already come the first time, so you becoming a new creature is already doable by faith in Jesus Christ, but he's also coming the second time. Here's one last thing you need to know. When he comes the second time, it'll be too late to become new in Christ at that time. Why? Because salvation and God's offer of eternal life is always and only by faith. And once it becomes by sight, faith isn't an option anymore. Why do we preach the gospel? Because people need to hear now that now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He could come at any time. Those that are left here will, believe, will be under a strong delusion to believe a lie. No, I read in my Bible where it is possible for people to get saved during the tribulation period, but now is the day to get saved. If you're here today and you don't know that you've trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation, that's something that you need to get settled today. Your October 17th, 1984 could be today, August the 13th, 2023. And that could be the day that you're able to look back on and say it was that day that I realized that I had made sinful decisions and that had separated me from God. But I believed that Jesus died on the cross for me and rose again to be a living Savior. And I called upon Him and I trusted Him and, and I was reconciled to God because of what Jesus did for me. I know I'm forgiven. I know I have eternal life. I know I'm going to live eternally in His presence. And eternity starts today. Not one day when I die. But it starts today. And it can start today for you. Let me ask for heads to be bowed and eyes to be closed. Nobody's looking around. The first creative act of God starts.